Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Gus, I saw Gus walking up here, being here in the, in a second. I had a number of folks emailed me that said they couldn't come. Uh, Skip, my friend Skip couldn't come. My wife Becky couldn't come and the Rousseaus, uh, husband and wife that usually sit right there. They couldn't come. Got a few other folks that said they couldn't make it, but they'd watch it on video. But then, uh, good morning. Good morning. Come on in. So, um, a couple of wonderful things. I was here for the men's group last night, and first I sat for an hour and 15 minutes in one of those chairs. Yeah. And I understand why you like the cushy chairs. <laughs> and then I happened to mention, just in conversation with Pastor Dan, about. Um, some of the people in the group were wondering what happened to this row of chairs. And he says, yeah, I don't know anything about it. And I walk in and there they are today. So I don't know how they got here. And then I was wondering how you turned those lights on. And I was gonna ask one of the gentlemen last night, but I didn't get a chance. And then I just happened to walk in the little room there to get some books and I pushed a button and the lights came on. So, And then I asked for some kind of thing in the background here because the windows in the back bring in so much light and they bring in this beautiful big thing for me and a dry marker board I don't even need <laughs> today so I thought I better write something on it you know but somebody with really good art skills uh, yeah. drawing on that looks yes like. well <laughs> maybe last night yeah <laughs> Was this the board you were trying to use last night too? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, yeah, now that I see, I can see what you were writing on. Well, you did get a uh, semi release. Erased. Yes. I'm, I'm sure it looks um, on, on camera watching your teaching with the screen, but I'll just let you know, I was sitting just a couple rows up in the, where the thing goes up, I couldn't see a thing you were writing. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought maybe they'd do that. And I, I thought so too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you might want to, if you do that again, because what you were saying was wonderful, it's just, and I could figure out what you were saying, but couldn't, you know, see, it. couldn't see it. So just for future reference. So here to help out. Yeah. So. Also, that smudge over there on the right, just for the ladies. The ladies did the sin? The sin? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the <laughs> She used a permanent marker and thought she could erase it. Yeah. Well, no, but it's not. She didn't use, probably didn't use a permanent marker. We found out, Pastor Tim has figured out that this is, uh, it's been washed so many times with the wrong thing. I got you. Okay. That it's taken the uh, sheen off of it for, for that. So, well, good. Folks are trickling back in. So, good. Good to see you all. I think it takes more than that to erase sin. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Okay. All right. Let's pray and we'll get into our study for today. Thank you for coming out. Father, we thank you for another beautiful, beautiful morning. It is indeed the day you have made. So we will rejoice and be glad in it. We can rejoice and be glad, not because of uh, circumstances we may be facing, because some of us might be going through tough times. But Lord, we can rejoice and be glad in this day because it's the day you've made and that you're a sovereign God and you rule and reign over your creation. You dwell within the hearts of your children. What could happen to a child of God that could destroy us? Nothing can destroy us, Lord God. Even if our life were to be taken today, we'd be ushered right into your presence. So Father, we pray for peace, we pray for healing, we pray for encouragement, we pray that you would uh, work situations in such a way that uh, we may be relieved of any particular pain or aggravation, but ultimately, Father, we know you use all things uh, for our good, Father, that we might be a little bit more like Jesus. Father, you didn't come to make us happy. Father, you came here so that we might be set free from sin and become children of God. So we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, be with each today. I know there's some who uh, wrote me that they weren't feeling well or had other situations that came up. Lord, please be with them. And Lord, open our ears that we might hear you very clearly. That Father, again, we might leave this place more like you. So thank you again for this privilege to share and a privilege to study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 
Well, this morning I plan on finishing Psalm 1 and um, move into, I'm believing, uh, Lord willing, the 23rd Psalm. Very popular Psalm, but sometimes it's so popular, so well known, that we miss the beautiful things that are really written in their force. So, uh, but before we look at Jesus or the Lord, the shepherd, today we want to talk about the Lord, the judge, because we're now at the last part of this uh, beautiful first Psalm, where it's basically going to talk about the, uh, the unredeemed. So let's, let's read the entire Psalm, because it's not long, the first Psalm, and then we'll talk about verses four, five, and six. Blessed, I'm reading from the NIV, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Now, um, because the dry marker board was here today, I thought I ought to write something on it. So uh, for the sake of the effort someone put. So this is just what we looked at last week. And I uh, remember I mentioned to you Watchman Nee's little book called Sit, Walk, Stand, which is a very general overview of Ephesians. You want a detailed understanding of Ephesians, come on Wednesday night to Pastor Tim's class. This is just a nice overview. And what he does in this is shows us that, uh, does anyone want to tell me what it, what's the references to sit, walk, and stand? What, what, why does he spend the first three chapters and we see at least two times, I believe, a reference to seated. We know Christ is seated in the heavenly places. We are seated with Christ. What's the significance of that? Do you remember from what I said last week? Our position. Our position in Christ. It's important that if we're gonna live this Christian life, if we're gonna fight against the enemy, we need to know who we are. Is that uh, any of you, any of you in the military at all? Okay, I can't help but think that the day you signed up and you're there at boot camp, and I wasn't planning on talking about any of this stuff, so hopefully we'll finish Psalm 1 today. <laughs> I don't know where this stuff comes from, you know. But what's, when you lined up there and you were 18 years old and you were skinny as a rail and you're, you know, scared to death of what's going on, you know nothing about the military, basically. What's the first thing that sergeant said to you, besides cussing you out and calling you a maggot or something like that, what did he tell you you were? Our property. Oh, yeah, okay. Besides, <laughs> yes, besides our property, he told you you are a soldier. And you're thinking, I, I, I'm, I don't feel like a soldier. No, you signed in. You signed the contract, you know, whatever. You were sworn in. Was it this hand? I don't know which hand you raised. You're sworn in. When you're sworn in, what are you? You're a soldier. When we came to faith in Christ, the moment we came to faith in Christ, we are seated in heavenly places. Is that we are in Christ. Christ is in us. So it's so important that we know who we are in Christ. You are a Christian. You may be brand new. You still have things of the flesh that we all still are dealing with. That, but especially when you first come to faith, you, your first week in, as, as a Christian, there might be some things coming out of your mouth that are not becoming of a Christian. But hopefully the Holy Spirit is quickly saying to you, no, no, edify, build up, don't tear down, or, or whatever it is. You're learning, you're growing. But it's important that we know who we are in Christ. And that's why first three chapters of Ephesians are all about what God has done. Very few, if any, admonitions of what we have to do. 
But often when we tell someone they've come to Christ, what, what did I say last week? Uh, that once someone, you, you happen to have the privilege and the honor of praying with someone as they come to faith that moment and they happen to be a friend of yours, what do we often say to them next? And what we, and what, this is okay, but what do we often say to them next? Or they look at you to say, oh, I, 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 I guess I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Now what? Yes, and we, we lovingly say to them, okay, come to church, pray, read your Bible, give of your, your blessings to others, tell someone about Jesus. All of those things are wonderful, but if we're not careful, what are we telling them? Things we have to do, and, and in our mind, because we're all legalists at heart, we think it means, oh, I have to do this to keep myself as a Christian. If you just got a, a job and your, your boss said, okay, you, you are vice president in charge of marketing or whatever, you don't just sit at the desk and with your nameplate and just collect the paycheck. You got to get to work. Now, if you don't do your work at your job, what will happen? Yeah, you're going to be fired. Now, we take that mindset over to our Christian faith. Of course. We need to be, we ought to be in God's house. Of course we need to talk to our Lord. Of course we need to read it. Of course we want to give of our blessings. But we don't do those things to keep ourselves saved. Those things will naturally come out of us as the spirit of Christ lives inside of us. And I've already spent more time than I wanted to. So once we know who we are in Christ, what's the next thing we see in Ephesians 4? Ephesians 4 tells us right at the beginning there, Ephesians is in the New Testament, right? <laughs> Ephesians 4 says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. But what does the King James say? Walk. Now that you know who you are, now that you have your, your weapons, you know you're a soldier, you know how to use it, start walking. And now we start walking out the Christian life. And as we walk out that Christian life, I'm trying to summarize this real quick, we get to chapter six, where it tells us about four or five times to stand, stand our ground against who? Against the enemy, because we know who we are in Christ. We're walking in the truth of who we are. We can stand against the enemy. Now you can stand against the enemy two minutes after you come to faith in Christ. But I'd be a real reluctant to, you know, someone who's just come to faith and knows nothing about it, throw them into a, a den of demons and say, okay, take over, you know, there. You know, no, we want to know who we are in Christ so we can walk in it and we stand against the enemy. Well, I tell you all that because in Psalm 1, we see this interesting use of a different order of it, of what we're not to do as far as uh, the people we associate with that it tells us that we do not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. And I was showing you how that was a downward digression of walking in step with them, meaning in tune you know, with the, uh, with the unbeliever, because what can you do if you're walking with that unbeliever and now they're saying, while we're walking, hey, let's go to the strip club there. What can you do? You can stop. You can walk away. Okay? This is not to imply that we're not to interact with unbelievers. Of course we are. How else are they going to see Christ in us? This is just, the writer's just laying this foundation for the rest of the Psalms and the rest of the Bible. For us as Christians to keep in mind, be careful of how you associate with, with the world. Because if you walk with them, then you may end up standing with them and now standing in agreement with them. Now you're not moving, you're standing with them. And then if you're not careful, you're gonna end up sitting with them. Now, nothing wrong with sitting with unbelievers. Don't take that to where it's not supposed to go. It's talking about being so enmeshed with them that now you're not walking with Jesus. You're now hoping, you know, did I tell you this last week? But I knew a fellow many, many, many years ago, kind of, a, if I may say this, kind of simple-minded, loved Jesus, but, you know, 
just simple minded and um, attended church here many, many years ago. And he told me just we're just chatting and he says, uh, yeah, I, uh, I go to the, uh, the strip club right up the street here um, because I'm hoping that the girls will come by and sit by me so I can tell them about Jesus. <laughs> now, please understand. He was not a hypocrite. He, he was a, a, a weak brother who, again, was simple-minded. I had to say, I said, oh, brother, <laughs> your, your heart may be right in one sense, but on the other sense, oh, that's your flesh talking a little bit. That's kind of an excuse to go, you know, there where he goes, oh, I never really thought about that, you know? And so that's why we need to be careful, but we need to be in the world, but not, you know, up here. So that's where the digression is going. And then he tells us that this person, though, who does not do those things is uh, like a tree planted by the, by the water. I'm, I'm doing too much review, you know, here, which I shouldn't be, you know, doing. But we see here that we, as children of God, were to dwell on God's word. It tells us to meditate on these things to soak ourselves in God's word. That's why having an in-depth study, as Pastor Tim is doing, having a Bible study like this. Now, we ought to be doing this on our own, but don't we all agree that we, we need help? We need brothers and sisters? Not that I'm a know-it-all, Tim's a know-it-all, Pastor Tim's a know-it-all, but we have a little <laughs> special training. I mean, we, we you know, this, this is something we've devoted our, our life to and our education to so that we can share the word. So we should get around godly brothers and sisters that share the word, you know, with us to help us understand that. Sure, get yourself a good study Bible. What's the danger, though, of a good study Bible? How can there be a danger of the study Bible? I think Pastor Lloyd taught me this. He said, study Bibles are great, but what ends up happening, if you're not careful, is you read the study, the study notes, more than you read the Word. You know what I'm saying? That The study notes end up becoming your gospel as opposed to the Word, you know, it, itself. So yes, get yourself where you can, you know, get some good teaching and, you know, whatever. Well, now we come to the contrast. I hope his office eventually get us over there. Now we come to where the, the contrast is. And we know that the Lord cares for and prospers the righteous. And let me ask you this. When it tells us there, the leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. That has been taken way out of context by some groups. Is the writer of this psalm teaching us a prosperity gospel that we all will have wealth and all have, you know, a nice car and whatever? Most of the time, most of the time, I could give you a percentage. When the scriptures talk about the Christian prospering, what's it speaking of? Growing spiritually, prospering spiritually. How many of you can testify? I don't know if, if again, the men's group was so good last night too. So I think we might've been talking about it there. But, but how many of you can say that you went through a tough time, a hard time, but now that you've gotten through it, by God's grace and mercy, you are more like Jesus. Amen. You're not you're not happy about that. We don't wish that on anyone. There's a dear woman that I know from our church that is is near death. She may die, you know, this week. The amazing thing is, <laughs> we thought she was not going to make it to Christmas, and she's home with her family, and she's only. 72 something like that but she's got cancer all through her through her body and it's a it's a miracle that she's been she saw christmas she saw new year's and i'm talking where i go over and see her and we're sitting on the back porch and she can't eat she has to take just you know uh, fluids what do you what we just said call well uh but she wasn't too, but whatever she had to take, it couldn't be anything solid. I never saw, I never met a woman in my life that had such faith. And I don't mean faith, God's going to heal me, but such rest and peace. And she's thankful for every moment she has that she can still be with her husband and her two grown daughters and friends. But she says, I'm, I'm ready to go home. And that doesn't mean she's given up. She hasn't given up at all. She says, I wake up the next morning, 
I'm going to use it for the Lord. But I know when I breathe my last, I'll be breathing in heaven. And I thought, what a beautiful faith this woman, you know, has. And so here the Lord is turning this lemon into lemonade. Kurt. Isn't that exactly the beginning of Psalms 1, blessed is the woman? Blessed is the woman? Yeah. yeah. That's exactly where she is. Yeah, she's exactly. Right there, okay. Exactly. You know, and she's shining her, the, the grace of God is shining out of her and it is just you know breath it's just uh, you, you leave her presence you know uh, as a, uh, a pastor former pastor you know i'm used to being in settings of i need to encourage this person you know this person's going this person's near death i need to encourage him <laughs> i i leave her presence i'm the one encouraged <laughs> i'm the one that walks out of there going wow that was a blessing <laughs> you know, and, and I hope she was encouraged as well, but I know she, she was, but that's just the spirit of God's grace, you know, and I seriously, I got in my car the last time I saw her and I sat there and said, Lord, I pray I will be like that. If my life, if I know that my life is winding down, whatever, that I will be like that shining, you know, God's grace and and glory okay so now we come to this contrast you know here uh, it tells us here in verses four and six four th five and six let's read it again not so the wicked not so the wicked what not so everything we just read here in verses three in verse three the person this that person the christian is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season whose leaf does not wither who whatever they do spiritually prospers not so the wicked now if you saw my my email i didn't know if you caught my joke but i i kind of thought about this and i said oh okay we could call this lesson the wicked get the chaff yes. and i, I it's kind of funny they get the shaft you know but anyway now you familiar with any farmers here Okay, well, I know nothing about farming. I'm from North Jersey. Jersey's the garden state. We have plenty of farming there, but I, you know, know nothing about farming, but you do read about things. But it's really interesting when you study what is going on here. Remember, this was a, an agrarian, is that the right way to say the word? An agrarian culture. Everything they did, for the most part, had to do with agriculture. Everyone was farmers. So that's why we see Jesus so often and, and Paul and others talking about farming illustrations. They got it, they under, understood it. So chaff is that the, the loose holes, or hole, not hole, hole, H-U-L-L, -L, or the outer shell of a grain. Now in Israel, the two most cultivated grains are what? Anyone know? Wheat and barley, exactly, wheat and barley. So each had its meat, its essence, surrounded by the protective, yet otherwise worthless shell called the chaff. And this chaff was separated from the edible grains, the important part, by a process of threshing and winnow winnowing, W-I-N-O-W-I-N-I-N-G. You know, um, sidebar, Randy gets on these sidebars. When I was a kid, I had a, a serious speech impediment. And I had all my letters, I had to go to speech class three times a week. You know, they had a specialist come in and back then, I was amazed that they did those sort of things because I got my R's wrong, my L's wrong, my THs wrong. So my name was Wandy Evans, you know? <laughs> Elmer Fudd was my hero, you know, <laughs> and stuff. So I had to learn how to talk all over again. So certain words I enunciate very carefully, but when I get excited and talk real fast, I kind of slur things together. But just a sidebar to encourage you, the very thing I struggled with, what did I end up doing for a living? I mean, but isn't that the grace and mercy of God? Is that he, you know, what the devil meant for harm, not blaming my speech impediment on, on the devil, but the Lord says, no, Randy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that one day for you. So anyway with windowing when the crop was harvested it was brought to a section of the farm that was flat and near the side of a hill and the farmer would often place a row of stones 
at the far side of the area away from the, the hill to keep the grain in. So the grain was rolled to make it flat and hard when the crop was piled inside this area. And this area was called the threshing floor. And they'd have the oxen walk all over this to break up the, uh, the chaff off of, the, uh, off of the, the grain, the main grain, you know, there. And so this process was called threshing. And now we also, Steve Camp, any Steve Camp fans, music of Steve Camp years ago? He had a song called The Threshing Floor. And it just popped into my head right now. I don't remember any of the lyrics, but it had to do with us being on the threshing floor. Is that the Lord, you know, not walking over us, but using the situations in our life to break off that outer worthless stuff so that we might grow and, and shine. So once all the grain was threshed, then another group of workers called the winnow, winnowers would gather the piles and would throw the grain into the air. And the reason this would happen at the bottom of the hill on a flat surface was that this is where the best breezes were, usually, especially the early evening. So as they threw the materials up in the air, the wind would blow away the chaff and uh, all that light, loose and worthless chaff. And it would blow out of the circle and the rocks at the lower end would keep the good, heavier grain in. So with the workers either threw up the grain with winnowing forks or with flat baskets. And this process, of course, is called winnowing. Now you know more about Ag agriculture in Israel than you ever thought you would. But anyway, this whole process was very typical and it was familiar to all the readers of the Psalm. When Jesus talked about the parable of the sower on the soil and that everyone understood what he was talking about there. Now the writer of this Psalm is using a very common procedure to illustrate very graphically how the wicked would be dealt with. It was not unusual for the righteous to be upset with the apparent blessing of the unrighteous. We see that a number of times in the Psalms. If you have your Bibles with you, quickly turn to Psalm 73. Halfway through. Well, no. Oh, yes, I guess it is halfway through. 73. Mm. 73, we see here in verse 3. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And don't you and I sometimes do that when we see the, the unrighteous prospering, we see movie stars that, you know, could give a, could care less, could care less. I could care less. I couldn't care less, is the proper way, of, you know, of anything spiritually, anything about the Lord, anything about the poor, and we see them prospering and we say, oh man, Lord, I've been working so hard. Listen, that's exactly what the writers of the Psalms were saying as well. That happens to us. Verse 12 of that Psalm. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. So the writer of this first Psalm wants, wants uh, the people, especially the righteous, to know right up front, not that we wish this on anyone, but he wants us to know right up front that the judge of all the earth would do right, Genesis 18, and that the wicked will get what they're, what's due them. You know, I'm sure you've heard it said before, but for the Christian, now think about this, you've probably heard it before, for the Christian, this life is the worst we will ever experience. Now you're thinking, well, what are you talking about? No, for the Christian, this life is the worst we will ever experience. Why? because we're gonna spend eternity, you know, with the Lord on a new earth and it's gonna be tear free. For the wicked, the unrighteous, the unbeliever, this life is the best they're ever going to have. Now, again, we should never get haughty about that and say, ah, they'll get theirs. We should always have compassion and always, always care for, for the wicked. But we do, do need to know that the judge of all the earth would do right. We're not universalists. What, what are universalists? Everybody's gonna go Everyone's going to go to heaven no matter what. That is the typical belief 
of, of the world is that, uh, oh, any firemen, policemen here? Okay, please don't take offense to this, but it, it saddens me because I've been in that setting where you had a gigantic, uh, uh, gigantic, a big funeral here for a young lady police officer that was tragically murdered by a fellow, you know, police officer here. Now I wasn't there, but I can almost guarantee what was said during the service. Because she served the people, because this person served as a patriot and served in the military, because they did all of this for their nation, then what? They're in heaven. I did a, <laughs> I did a memorial service. I hope I didn't just tell you the story. I don't think so. There was an older gentleman that was at my church that he was kind of a gruff, well, he was a gruff ex-military guy, came to faith in the Lord in late life, in his 70s, and, and just had a real gentle spirit about him. Well, he was active in a local group of other ex-military fellows, many of which who served in the same platoon together. And apparently they were in some serious, I don't know if they were there, you know, on D-Day or something, but they did some serious battles together. And a number of them lived in the area and their lead officer, when it was a colonel, whatever, lived in this area. So he came to the funeral. Some of the men came to the funeral and asked if they could say something about his military experience. Like, oh, by all means, you know, please do. I'm sitting there listening to this fellow. God bless him, but he gets up there and says, and Donald was a patriot. He loved this country. He served this country. He protected us. All these beautiful things. And I'm weeping listening to this because I love veterans. Listening to all this. And, and then he says, and we know he's in the big battlefield of the sky, you know, riding a white horse of you know, victory, <clears throat> whatever, because that was the key, because he served his nation sacrificially. And I'm sitting there going, oh man, how am I gonna follow this? <laughs> 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 and, and the Lord was very gracious. And this was the first time that Pastor Glenn did this at Saul's wedding. Actually, um, Pastor Glenn and I had lunch a few days prior to the, uh, to Saul's memorial service and we were, we were talking about it and I told him one thing that I always say and Glenn said it, Pastor Glenn said it in his service, but I used that opportunity to say, yes, Donald was a patriot. He loved his country. He served his country well, but Donald is not in glory today because he was a good father, was a good grandfather, was a hard worker at his job, that he was a good husband, that he put, he was baptized, he had communion, you know, he, all of these things. And, and I threw in there, or because he served his nation, his, you know, um, heroically, he's in glory for one reason and one reason only because of a simple faith in Jesus. Now I probably said a little bit more to affirm what the fellow was saying. I didn't want to, you know, you don't know nothing, dude. You know, it was all, it was all very gracious. It was all, Lord, please help me, you know, to say the right thing here. But that's, that's the bottom line. So <clears throat> the writer of the Psalms does want us to know, want his readers to know about the, uh, the plight of the wicked. Turn with me, if you would, to the 13th chapter of Matthew. Matthew 13. <clears throat> Here we find the Lord's great chapter of parables. Now down at verse 24, we have the parable of the weeds. And let's quickly look at this parable and what it has to say about how this relates to the first Psalm. Look with me at verse 24 through 30. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone's sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, <clears throat> didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? <clears throat> An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. 
Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, <clears throat> I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles and burn them, then gather the wheat and bring them into the barn. And then look here, verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. You do realize that many times Jesus told parables, didn't explain it to the people. He just told the parable and then later explained it to the disciples. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will, be, uh, they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Now, I know that's heavy, but the heathen may enjoy, again, as I said, their life here on earth, <clears throat> and in a fleshy sense, uh, even within the, in the church, as the parable suggests, but one day they will be threshed and widowed out from the presence of the righteous. Now, they may think that they're secure and stable, but in the end, they will blow away like that chaff, like nothing. And what a powerful contrast with the righteous. The righteous are like what? What did it tell us the righteous were? Trees. Trees. It didn't even say we were, you know, the, the grain of wheat, you know, because a grain of wheat, you know, but we're trees and we have our roots deep down in the Lord. And the moment you come to faith, the Lord makes you a tree and sends down roots and you're not gonna be uprooted. On no wise cast you out. Nothing can separate you from the love of God as it's found in Christ Jesus. But we do have a responsibility to get our roots down in the Lord. And how do we get our roots down in the Lord? Most important way is through his word, through godly living that comes with being with other believers, from godly teaching, God's word ultimately is where that is, is coming from. Uh, the wicked are des uh, described as chaff in a number of other places. You don't have to turn to it, but Job 21, 18 says, how often are they, the wicked, like straw before the wind, the chaff swept away by a gale. Isaiah 5, 24 poignantly says, therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw, and as chaff sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. <clears throat> and later in Isaiah 17, 13th verse, although the peoples roar like the roar of surging waters, when he rebukes them, they flee far away, driven before the wind like chaff on the hills like tumbleweed before a gale. Now remember, when Jesus was saying that, when Isaiah was saying that, when Jesus was saying that, when Paul was saying that, every person there did not need an explanation of threshing and winnowing, you know, and all that, because they understood, they said, oh boy, I get it, I get it. And that's why pastors today, we use illustrations that are, are relevant to us today that we say, oh, I see that, I get that. That's right where, where, where I'm at. So a chaff has no roots, no stability, no security, no uses. It has the appearance of style and success since it is wrapped around the actual grain, but it's all phony. Just as Jesus, what did Jesus say about the, uh, the Pharisees and how they looked? That is one of the most poignant descriptions and sad descriptions. Whitewashed, meaning they were clean and looked good on the outside. Whitewashed sepulchers. What's a sepulcher? A grave, a tomb. Whitewashed sepulcher filled with dead men's bones. Uh, when uh, my wife and I were up in New Jersey a couple months ago for an extended visit and we went to the uh, cemetery 
where uh, my parents were buried. And as you go through, you see incredible, I can't imagine how much they cost, but maybe, maybe years ago, yeah. it was all, all relative. These incredible edifices made of granite, carved in, you know, all of this detail. And I know nothing about the person, you know, but I couldn't help but think, there's a whitewashed sepulcher filled with dead men's bones. Mm -hmm. I hope, that that person knew Christ. I love it when I see on someone's tomb, you know, that uh, he lived for the glory of God or something, you know, like that. That would give you a, a sense, you know, of assurance, you know, there. So it looked good on the outside uh, because they're associated with the grain, but in the end, it's true colors and actually it's true nature is revealed. You know, sometimes around election time, politicians show up in church. <laughs> you know, and um, not and I don't want to forgive me for overgeneralizing. There's plenty that love love the Lord, but they show up in in church, and they make sure there's a photo op of them coming out of the the church or shaking the pastor's hand. And most would want to make sure they got in a picture of Pastor Tim because that would really make him look good. Yes. And, you know, I, it has not been me either. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. 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 I got a totally irrelevant story, so I won't tell it. <laughs> I can tell it. <laughs> this, see, this is my problem. When I, when I would preach on a Sunday morning, I would follow my notes carefully. I would write out what I would share. And I would talk extemporaneously, but I'd follow my notes, mainly because of what I'm doing right now, is that I would go off on a ride. And there was always, I like to believe something good and helpful. And <laughs> I once had someone say to me, this is not the story I wanted to tell you, but they said to me after the service, because I apologize for telling a story. Because I did what I'm doing right now, and I told a story, and I apologize, I'm sorry for that, you know, blah, blah, let's get back to where I was at person came up to me afterwards and said, that story is what changed everything for me. I go, okay, thank you, Lord. Yes. So <clears throat> I don't think this story is going to change anybody. <clears throat> a friend of mine, I actually do a little Bible study at his office on Thursday mornings prior to this. Um, <clears throat> he was, uh, he's best friends with uh, Bob Basham. If any of you know that name? He's the founder of the Outback and, um, what are the other, uh, my goodness, other big restaurants in the Bonefish. area? Bonefish. So he's the owner of all of these things. So a number of years ago, he was a co-owner of the Tampa Bay Rays. And so I occasionally would get tickets from him because he couldn't go to the game. But one time I went with my friend Steve and Bob Basham and another person. And these seats were on the dugout, the Rays dugout, the first four seats. So, best seats in the house. Well, this was when uh, Lou Pinella was the coach. And so I happened to be sitting next to Bob and Steve's on this side and I knew Bob, but I was buddies with him. Lou Pinella comes out of the dugout, you know, before the game, just kind of looking around. And he looks back and he sees Bob as a partial owner. He knows him. Hey, Bob, how are you? And so here they're talking to one another and me coming from Jersey, you know, I was, I loved the Yankees in those days. Lou Pinella. I mean, I love Lou Pinella. And so I'm just sitting there like a little kid. And finally, when there was a break in the action, I said, hi, Lou. I'll never forget it the rest of my life. Lou looked at me and went. <laughs> like, like, who are you? I'll, I'll nod to you, you know, so. Somehow that goes back to politicians standing next to Pastor Ted. <laughs> it got me nothing, you know, you know, from that. Anyway, it gave me a good story that I, that I like to joke about. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at this. This is important here. We're back to Psalm 1. I'm sorry. I'll get back on gear here. <clears throat> Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment. Now, many have misunderstood this verse because at first glance, it appears good news for the wicked. For the wicked not to stand in the judgment would be a welcome relief to them. Oh, good. 
God isn't going to judge me. I'm not going to stand in the judgment. But that's not what it's saying. What this verse sadly indicates is the wicked will not be able to stand in the judgment. They cannot withstand the awesomeness of standing before the glory of God. We see in the scriptures a number of times that what happened to men of God, men of God, who were confronted with the presence of the Lord. What happened to Isaiah? Remember when Isaiah was, was preaching, Israel was in disarray, divided kingdom, people were a mess, and he was one of the few righteous men. Isaiah chapter six, he has this personal encounter with the Lord. Holy man. Did he go up there and high five the Lord? No, what did he say? He actually said, oy vey. We joke about that, oy vey. But oy vey is a very serious term. Oy vey esmer, woe is to me. Meaning, this is the saddest day of my life. Woe is to me. I am a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. Now here's the most righteous man in Israel, but what immediately happened to him standing in the presence of a holy God? He saw, he saw his sin. It didn't mean he wasn't a believer, but he saw in the, in the glory of God, he saw who he really was. Not a hypocrite, I'm saying a man with clay feet. He saw because God is so holy. Habakkuk had a full-blown anxiety attack and said that death crept into his bones when the Lord confronted him. Habakkuk complaining, Lord, why is this? Why this? Why this? All of a sudden, the Lord shows up to him. <laughs> the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. What happened to him? Blinded. I don't believe that Paul slash Saul was blinded because the Lord said, I'm going to cause you to be blind right now to teach you a lesson. I believe that the brightness of God's holiness, because remember the other standing to him heard a thunder rumbling, but didn't hear anything. But I think the mere presence of the Lord blinded him. And to me, the greatest example, who was Jesus had a best friend. Who was that? John was Jesus' best friend spent the most time with them. Many believe because he was the youngest. Many believe he was the youngest. And for that reason, Jesus really took a liking to him. John on the Isle of Patmos has his vision and stands before the Lord. And what does it say happened to John? What did John say about that encounter? I fell to the ground as a dead man. Here he's in front of his best friend the glorified Jesus. And that was so awesome. And we use that word, oh man, that's awesome. It's, it's a shame that we have English words to try to describe the glory of God and whatever, and it gets watered down because our language is up. What's all mean? A-W-E. It's like, you know, reverence, fear, uh, shock. You know, you stand in awe of such and such. So here John stands before the awesome presence of a glorified Jesus and falls to the ground as a dead man. So without a doubt, when we come face to face with the Lord one day, it will be experience that defies description, but we will be able to withstand it. Why? Because of who we are in Christ is that I use this illustration, you know, quite a bit. You're coming out of a, you go to a movie theater in the middle of the afternoon, okay? And you're sitting in the dark uh, theater. Actually, you walk in and the lights just go down, just go down at that point. So you can't see a thing, but what happens eventually? You acclimate and you can see. Your pupils get real big, taking as much of the light as you can see. So you can say, oh, I do see Kirk two rows, you know, up there. So you can see a little bit. Movie ends, <coughs> excuse me, and you decide to go out the exit door in the front of the theater <coughs> to the parking lot, and it's bright sunshine. What happens when you open the door? Blinded. You are blinded. What do we do? And it reminds me of Romans 1, where it says that they, the wicked suppress 
the truth. They hide the truth. They hide, I cannot look at the glorious God, so I, I hide my eyes. But that won't happen to you and I. Even though we're not gonna go in and high five Jesus, I still, you know, he's our friend, he's our brother, but he's our God and savior. I think for the first thousand years, we're gonna be laying prostrate before the, before the Lord, but it's gonna be a welcoming experience, but we will be able to gaze into his eyes. Why? Because we have Christ's eyes, is that we'll be able to withstand that. But see, the wicked would not be able to do that. It's not the same for them. The heathen will stand before the Lord at the great white throne judgment, never able to even lift their heads up to look God in the eyes because their sin and wretchedness will be so obvious as they're confronted by the pure and perfect holiness of God that I believe they will actually beg God to cast them away from his presence. Can you imagine that? Now this is Randy speaking, there's not scripture for that, but that because of God's awesome holiness and purity, the unrighteous will literally say, please, Cast me to hell because I cannot tolerate. I can't handle. I can't stand, you know, before you with this. I need to get out of your presence. Proverbs 28 1 says something interesting that can possibly relate to this. The wicked man flees, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Isn't that interesting? The unrighteous flee, even though no one's pursuing them because of the fear in their, in their hearts. And I know this is probably speaks about the general fear and anxiety that grips the unbeliever because they have not experienced God's peace, but I believe it also says something, something more. Although God will not be chasing them at the great white throne judgment, they will flee from his presence out of a fear right in the place of, because they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're gonna, run to the place that's reserved you know for them i know pastor glenn said that in his new series he's going to be talking about hell at some point and although no one is it's not a pleasant experience it's still a biblical you know truth the righteous on the other hand will stand boldly before the lord not in pride or in their own confidence or even in their own strength but because we are family and we'll be standing before our Father. As overwhelming as the experience is going to be of standing before the Holy God, it will still be familiar to each and every one of us. You know, Christians often, you know, Pastor Tim was talking about heaven, you know, last night. And, and if you would, if I die today, I would be in the presence of the Lord, in a spiritual state, in heaven, wherever that might be. But that's not where I'm always going to be. I'm gonna be living on a new, a new earth here. So I do know that we Christians speak about going to the presence and uh, going to heaven and saying, oh man, I saw this and I saw this, I saw this, it's such a strange place. I feel like a stranger in a strange land. But I often think, just me speaking, and I base it on Ephesians that tells us we are seated in heavenly places. Not that we will be seated, it says we are seated spiritually. We're in Christ, seated in heavenly places. I have this idea. Anyone ever been to Hawaii? I've never been to Hawaii, but they say it is the most beautiful place on earth. And so we go to Hawaii, go, wow, look at this, look at this, look at this. I have a feeling when we get to heaven, we're gonna say, I'm home. I'm, I'm really home. And even though it'll be new, you're gonna feel like I'm home. And I don't think we're gonna to get to heaven and see Jesus, see a whole bunch of uh, people and wonder which one's Jesus. <laughs> what, what, which, you know, which painting, which painting did the best job? <laughs> even though we've never seen them, I have a sense in my heart that we were absolutely no, and it, we're gonna look at him and go, I, I absolutely know who you are because you've been in me, I've been in you, even though I haven't seen you, I, I, I mean, I'm speechless right now. I, literally, I'm, I'm saying to you, I'm speechless right now just thinking about that moment. 
of seeing him and going, Dad. You know, it, it's like when, uh, it's not like, but when someone finds out they meet their father, maybe they were adopted. And they meet their father after many, 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 many years. And maybe they look alike, but they wouldn't be able to pick them out of a, a lineup of 10 guys, more than likely not. So you would say, you're my dad? Yes, I'm, I'm your father. And you'd reluctantly kind of give him a hug because he's your father, but you don't really know him. That's not gonna happen to us, is that we're going to see the Lord and just know right away this is where we belong. So, getting back to this, we've got a few more minutes to go here. Um, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, they won't be able to, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. What's an assembly? A group, a church, a, an ecle, I don't, I can't speak Greek. You know, I can barely speak English. You know, ecclesia, an assembly, you know, a gathering together of people of like mind of like spirit. And so it says that they will not, sinners in the assembly of the righteous, they will not be amongst us, you know, at that time. So that's the sad news for them. But let me finish. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Jesus said himself that narrow is the way, wide is the way that leads to destruction narrows the way that leads to the Lord. But I kind of picture this, is that even though wide is the way for the unrighteous, they are literally walking through a jungle with no path. They don't know where they're going. It's a very wide jungle. It's not a wide road, it's a wide jungle. And they're cutting through it, hoping that this is gonna get them where they're going, and they find out they're just going around, you know, in circles, because they're completely lost. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. But narrow is the way. And you're thinking, well, gosh, if it's narrow is the way, I, I hope I can stay on it. I hope I can find it. But what does it tell us here? For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. The footsteps of the righteous, it says elsewhere in Psalms, the footsteps of the righteous are ordered or directed by the Lord. Is that we will be able to stay on that narrow path. You know, if you're, uh, what's the quickest way to get to Ocala from here? I closed my Bible, that means I'm done. I-75, right? Quickest way to get there. But now, does 41 go up that way? Okay. Well, so, you're going, your goal is to get to Ocala. The quickest way, the safest way, in a sense, is maybe, is stay on 75. Boom, straight there. That's the Lord's perfect will for us, that we, doubt, we would not sin and we'd stay on that path. But what happens to all of us? We, we pull off 75 to use the restroom, and then we can't seem to get back on 75 right there, and we say, well, this is going north, so I'll go on 41. Now, it may be a very beautiful ride, and go through small towns. This is where my analogy breaks down, so forget about that. <laughs> you know? But, you're getting to where you need to go. It's just going to take you longer, more stops, cattle crossing. You're going to run over a nail and get a flat tire. Now you got to find some small garage open somewhere in some little town I can't even make up right now. You know, So it's going to be a little bit of a hassle to get there. But you're going to get there because the good work the Lord starts, he's faithful to complete. He'd rather we stay on the interstate. But we do some of our best learning when we get off the main track. I'm not telling us to sin. I'm not telling us to do that. But it tells us right there, I close my Bible, is that it says the Lord will guide us. And that's what the Lord wants. That's why I think the first Psalm is where it is. It would have been cool if Psalm 1 was before Genesis 1. <laughs> In other words, let's get this part right. And then everything else will make sense. Is that we have to be careful of, it shows us where, who we're not sitting, standing and walking, not walking, standing and sitting with on a continuous basis. He shows us what happens when we are firmly rooted in him, that we're refreshed by those streams of living water. We see the outcome, unfortunately, of the righteous is why we need to pray for those that don't know the Lord. 
but we're comforted in knowing that the Lord God is going to direct our path. And as we continue to go through the Psalms and in Ephesians and any other teaching that we have from God's word, we can trust that the Lord, it's a, he's a lamp before our feet and he's going to guide us and direct us. All right, questions, comments on Psalm 1. Boom, 1030. Questions or comments on side one, uh, Psalm 1. All right, Lord willing, I believe we're going to look at the 23rd Psalm. You think, oh, I guess I can stay home a couple weeks. I know that one. No, we're going to talk about some amazing things. That would be wonderful. One of the first books given to me, and I don't have it anymore, I don't think, given to me from my father-in-law when I came to faith was A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. I forgot the fellow's name. Um, I have a yeah, he, he, he was a farmer, and it's a beautiful, I'm not using that book as a reference, I don't think I own it any longer, but it really had an impact on my life, so that's why I want us to talk about the 23rd Psalm. Okay, questions, comments? Dwayne, by the way, welcome Dwayne, Dwayne's with us. I knew Dwayne back in the old days, we played softball, the church softball team together. <laughs> Boom! Anyway, yes, Dwayne. Just a couple thoughts running through my mind about what you're talking about, getting on I-75. Sometimes you can get off 75 and you start to drift a little bit. You're trying to find your way back. Maybe you're too stubborn to ask. <laughs> and so you just drift man. further and further. And yeah. So, you know, it's important to get back into God's word and to back into your determination to get this mm -hmm. going in the right direction. And the other thing is, uh, you know, I just kept thinking about an insurance plan. What a great insurance plan we have. You know, it's like the best salesman could ever offer us. Mm -hmm. You know, we trade this life and whatever, you know, problems we have if we serve God, we can look at the, the plan that mm -hmm. he has for us. And, and he paid. Any you could possibly yeah. have for eternity. And, and he paid for that insurance plan also, yeah. you know, for us. Yep, that's a good word. All right, Father, thank you for meeting here with us today. Thank you for the encouragement that I received from your word and from just the... Uh, wonderful spiritual Christian energy I've gotten from my friends. That sounds kind of hokey, Lord. I didn't really mean that. But Lord, thank you for the presence of my brothers and sisters here and how they've encouraged me. And I pray that we leave this place uh, understanding your word, praying for those that don't know you, Father. Lord, we don't know what you have in store for anyone, Father. You just told us to love people, to pray for them, and be Jesus around them. So, Lord, help us to do that very thing this day. Bless your people this day. Give us an opportunity to love someone and point them to Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Great to have you all today. If you are newer, like I don't recognize you, brother, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew? Henry. Henry. Henry doesn't sound anything like Andrew. How did I get Andrew out of that? Henry, great to have you here today. But anyone else, if you're newer and you're not on the sign-in sheet there, put your name, number, uh, phone number, and email address so we can get you on the list. And if you didn't check in, please do. Okay? Love one another. Good to see you.